Okay, hello everyone. This is Hamayn Aryan. Thank you all for joining. Uh, we had a great talk last week by Eric Donovan and we will continue on the subject of Aurora today. It's great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Liz McDonald. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of New Hampshire and has spent nine years at Los Alamos National Laboratory as a postdoctoral researcher, staff scientist and a team leader. At Los Alamos National Laboratory, she primarily focused on experimental plasma mass spectrometer instruments for NASA's Van Allen probes and Lanon payloads for g circonus orbit. Dr. Liz McDonald first witnessed the Aurora as part of her PhD work in Alaska, building instruments that fly on board research rockets to measure the particle precipitation causing the lights. In 2012, she founded the citizen science project Aurora Suras uh, to take advantage of new sources of data in the first solar maximum with social media. The project has received interdisciplinary funding from Los Alamos National Laboratory, the U.S. National Science Foundation, and NASA as part of the NASA Space Science Fa Education Consortium. Since 2014, she has been a civil servant at Colorado Space Flight Center and has led aspects of the fast plasma investigation as part of the MMS mission, in addition to continuing her early research. As a result of her research and leadership with the Steve's scientific discovery, Liz was recognized by individual and group NASA awards in 2019. Most notably, the agency's exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal. In addition to work based at Goddard, she collaborates with citizen scientists around the world and serves the Heliophysics Division as lead of the Strategic Working Group on Citizen Science. Today she will be discussing the STEEP, the sub aurora phenomena. As always, our presentations are recorded, so I would like to remind you to keep your microphones muted. If you have questions, you can post them in the group chat or send them directly to me. Uh, Dr. Liz, thank you for accepting our invitation. Please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be here virtually with all of you and to give this talk on a relatively new feature in the sky. And uh, also this talk is well situated between the prior really excellent talks on the electron and proton aurora and next week's talk on substorms and convection. So this is like a little palate cleanser about Steve, which is um, in many ways one feature, one small feature in the subauroral region, um, but it could be the ultimate magnetosphere ionosphere coupling challenge. And I think it's a challenge that we can solve. So that's very uh, exciting. Uh, but we are not there yet. Um, okay, so, whoops. So uh, I want to definitely start with acknowledgements um, for all the many citizen scientists who have contributed images and data along the way. Um, on this phenomena, many colleagues around the world who have um, contributed as well, um, team members from Aurorasaurus. Uh, I want to point people to a recent um, CEDAR session organized by Bea Gallardo Lacourt um, that is recorded and on YouTube. So if you would like to hear a couple hours of researchers presenting their latest research on Steve, uh, that is highly recommended, and uh, this nice little word cloud is from that event made by Bharat. Um, so, as I said, this is an exciting challenge, um, and it's work in progress, and it's collective work that's going on in many different places around the world um, by many different teams. And um, is probably a little more technical than some of the talk that I give, but maybe a little less technical than some of the other seminars. And so I'm trying to uh, do that for a couple of reasons. One, to keep it um, understandable to a broad variety of audiences. 
and also to sort of be light on the jargon so that different people in the field from different areas can talk to each other. All right. Um, the outline of the talk, roughly, we'll talk a little bit of introduction, a little bit about citizen science, which is so critical to this discovery. Um, then talk about what is Steve, in case you do not know, uh, some of the basic characteristics, and then um, some of the new, new features uh, from the um, ionospheric perspective and the magnetospheric perspective, and the really important coupling where we are um, trying to figure out how those things drive each other and cause this phenomena that we see. Um, and I will end with some open questions. I definitely can't do justice to all of this work, um, and it's time limited and sort of subjective what I am uh, pulling together today. So definitely encourage people to um, use the chat, add more details, have more discussion there. So that's great. Um, all right. Uh, these are a few of the photos that go along with my bio that um, uh, Homian uh, uh, read and um, basically uh, talking about background as both working on rockets that study aurora and then moving out to the magnetosphere, working on instruments for geosynchronous orbit and the Van Allen probes um, and testing those instruments. And then kind of taking a right turn in my career and getting this idea to um, pursue uh, citizen science and an app where people could report Aurora and help them get a better understanding of Aurora. So that's what I'm doing primarily now with a focus still on the science as well. All right, uh, can't really do this virtually, but I would like to know a little bit more about you guys and maybe you want to put this in a chat, especially for different people out there. Have you seen Aurora? Often in these audiences of space scientists, probably about half of them have not seen Aurora, even if it's something that like they might have studied for their entire PhD. So uh, I think that's interesting. And also I'm curious how many people are familiar with citizen science. That's certainly um, evolving. And I want you to kind of ask yourself both of these questions. If you're not familiar with them, why not? Um, and of course, it's difficult to see Aurora but it's also um, important. So a little background on citizen science. Um, in our field, we have many excellent use cases for citizen science because the domain is so large and uh, people can really help um, their instruments, cameras, and other commercial off-the-shelf instruments are rapidly getting better and better. And, um, and we have technologies to pull all that together and synthesize those results um, and use that with our traditional satellite and ground-based observations to complement each other. So citizen science observations are not gonna replace our Cadillac instruments, but they can supplement them in very useful ways. Um, and Steve kind of, is the ultimate um, example of that. Uh, this slide um, does show the Aurora Source platform that um, was built to collect observations from all over the globe of who's seeing Aurora when and use that to build a better alert system and gain more information on these rare types of um, Aurora uh, and large storms, Aurora during large storms. Um, so that's been happening over the last solar maximum, especially, and we are now evolving into the next solar maximum. Um, so there's a number of papers there you can check out to learn more about the platform. Um, if you want to learn more about citizen science, that is actually what I'll be highlighting quite a bit of relative to Steve in this talk. Uh, but there are some excellent resources there, such as this book by Dr. Karen Cooper. Um, and when you look at that, you realize that this is not just happening in space physics. This is happening all over the world. Um, and it's really a cool way that people can participate in science and ask questions, collect data, 
make discoveries um, and it really works on this massive scale and when properly designed can um, lead to reliable outcomes. And so I definitely like to say that the Aurora is not just a pretty picture such as in this Nike ad. Uh, these data are really useful and um, this is a way to collect them as well. Um, so citizen science has uh, all kinds of scales and disciplines working together. You definitely need to consider um, how you do your community outreach and um, who the citizen scientists are who might be volunteering for your project, what the terms of use of those data are, and um, how we use them scientifically, uh, keeping to that's really important to consider, especially which, with such beautiful, valuable images as Aurora citizen scientists have. Um, and, and then what are the science goals and are they appropriate to the data quality? All of those are important um, to consider. Uh, citizen science at NASA is growing. Putting on my headquarters hat, I am definitely a the point of contact for heliophysics and am happy to help people um, learn more about citizen science if I can. So happy to uh, talk to people who might be interested. Heliophysics does have um, a growing support of uh, citizen science and a strategic working group on that topic. Um, there is a SMD wide policy, which is really great encouraging citizen science where appropriate in any ROSE's proposal or even in missions. And then um, a couple of things, there's a seminar series this summer that's really excellent, all about citizen science, focusing on NASA, citizen science for the practitioner community. And then there are, um, there's actually new money um, and the new money that's available right now is supporting seed funding. And so there is a, um, solicitation in NSPIRES called CSSFP uh, that is um, in draft release right now, which means it will be coming out and will be available this year. Um, so that's my little pitch on citizen science. Uh, now we can meet Steve. Uh, Steve is um, one type of subauroral arc. It's the optical manifestation of an extreme uh, subauroral and it's kind of the coolest creature of the night. <laughs> so Steve is pretty inspiring as well. Um, you can follow Steve uh, as a buddy on Twitter and follow sightings of Twitter. And um, that's, that's great too. I was going to try playing a video, um, which might not work at all, but it's a video that talks about the story of how Steve uh, came to be. And there are many different um, great stories about this. Eric Donovan has a great TED talk and Neil Zeller has a um, really excellent synopsis from his point of view in that recent CDAR session. Um, okay, so I'll click play and then we'll see, stop me. I can also turn the audio off and talk to this video. Um, but we'll, we'll try it. People were out observing the Aurora, and they started noticing something that was overhead as well when they were seeing the Aurora far to the northern regions. It was unlike most Aurora. Talk to the scientists, we didn't know what it was, and together, they said, we'll keep taking observations and we'll call it Steve in the meantime. Steve is mostly a very narrow purple arc and sometimes it has these little green features that go along with it as well that are kind of like waving fingers or a picket fence. That means that there's plasma physics happening up there to cause that light and to make these little discrete features that we don't understand yet. We now have some satellite observations from the ESA satellite called SWARM that show uh, that Steve optically is associated with a very strong flow 
um, in the particles in the ionosphere, the upper level of our atmosphere. Speed is important for a number of reasons. Um, it's really exciting that uh, people on the cameras all over the globe can capture something that we didn't fully understand and shed new light on that. It's also really exciting that this happens further to the south where there are more, there are more people. So it might be a kind of aurora that more people can see than the usual kind. We're now able to look up at the sky and see things about the aurora and this sub-auroral region that we never understood before. And then we can correlate that with our traditional observations and lead to greater understanding. Okay, I don't know if you guys were able to hear that. I apologize if you weren't. There might be a setting I didn't have that uh, I needed to do. Um, but that video is available on NASA's SVS um, website. And I will now be talking about the Steve observations. Um, so pretty much we'll cover what's in that video if you couldn't hear it. Um, okay, so um, this is a video on the left from Natani Barasa, who took a very important time lapse of Steve um, that ended up um, having um, observations from the Canadian ground-based array, as well as an overflight from SWARM. ...of Steve um, basically were kind of it pho photobombing the Milky Way. Um, citizen scientists were out and uh, they were taking longer exposures than uh, typical ASIs run all sky imager imagers. And they were picking up more photons and picking up this faint purple arc um, that looks like a contrail to the naked eye. Uh, and sometimes it has these little green features that are really uh, um, unstable and transient. And um, those as well, like you really need a camera to pick up. Um, okay, so now we'll talk about some of those defining characteristics of Steve. Uh, what the heck is a subauroral ion drift? Um, and some of the open questions. Uh, we've made a lot of recent progress on Steve from this initial observation, uh, but there are still um, a lot of interesting open questions, especially in uh, from the different perspectives of, is this a magnetospheric event or is this a um, uh, ionospheric event and how those two work together. Um, okay, I have a couple of nice slides here from Shaning Chu um, that I appreciate. Uh, and you can see the different perspectives of Steve. Uh, these are all different events um, and these are all uh, very nice um, professional level photographer um, images. Um, so Steve is mostly purple with a little bit of this picket fence that doesn't always look like a picket fence. Um, it's a narrow arc that's arran uh, arranged east-west for hundreds of miles, thousands of kilometers. Um, it's been observed all over the world, uh, but especially a lot over um, North American Canadian sector, uh, especially Alberta. Um, and uh, definitely a big shout out to the Alberta Aurora Chasers, Chris Ratzlaff, and many others who collaborated with Aurorasaurus and through their own group have collected a lot of observations of Steve uh, and encouraged that as well. Um, so it lasts 20 minutes uh, up to a couple hours. It's kind of, um, it's very much a boundary. It's quite stable, it's quite faint. Um, but uh, it also moves a little bit as well. Um, it's not entirely new. It has definitely been observed. Um, before we called it Steve, uh, the citizen scientists were calling it a proton, um, proton arc. And that term kind of refers to the fact that it's below the usual aurora. You can see the usual aurora to the north in these images. Um, but it's definitely not uh, proton aurora, um, which is subvisual and um, 
uh, broad. So uh, the new term is Steve and that came about, um, as I said, with putting together the Canadian um, All Sky Imagers from the University of Calgary and Eric Donovan's group there, capturing this as well as multiple citizen scientists capturing it on the ground. And um, the swarm satellite uh, flying through this event uh, at higher altitude. And so when we see, um, when we put all of that together in a time history here, on the x-axis on the right hand side, um, you see the swarm satellite, uh, a couple of minutes of data, and um, it increasing in uh, latitude, basically cutting north to south. Um, <clears throat> and you can see uh, the, the four panels that are in blue are the satellite data, and then the upper uh, most panel is the intensity in the all sky imager. Um, and that is mapped to about 200 kilometers. Um, and we can see the um, specific latitudinal range that coincides with that, coincides with this very strong um, ion drift in the second panel. Um, the ions are drifting west uh, about five kilometers per second, extremely fast, maybe more like six. Um, there's a very small downward field line current. There's an enhancement of electron temperature in this region up to extremely hot temperatures. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there's a um, uh, density trough um, as well. Um, um, I'm going to grab a little bit of water, sorry. Okay, I'm back, sorry. Um, all of this was put together in our science advances paper. Um, and this is the same slide with all this data. I did want to point out that um, what this looks like is stream subauroral ion drift. And um, those have been observed by satellites for 40 years and studied extensively. Uh, in, it's important to note that um, the swarm satellite track, <clears throat> as you can see on the left hand side here, is cutting across this east-west arc. And so people on the ground can actually see the east-west arc appear. They can see it, it often starts in either the east or the west and then fills the whole sky. Um, and they can see how long it lasts. Uh, whereas with a satellite, you're going to be moving very quickly and you're going to be cutting through this um, really narrow feature uh, very quickly. And if the Steve only lasts 90 minutes, the next time that satellite comes through, you might not see it. Um, so having the observations on the ground and being able to pick them out very well on the ground is important to helping to understand this. Okay, so um, what is a subaural ion? <clears throat> so uh, there's a very nice paper by he et al. Uh, I think it's 2015 um, with 18,000 events observed from DMSP. Um, <clears throat> and it shows the solar cycle dependence of these SAIDs uh, and what average uh, latitude they appear at, how, what average um, small amount of of a field line current they have, and um, uh, all kinds of characteristics. Of it. Um, when in the year you see them, often in spring and fall, which is often when we see the most um, rural storms. Um, the other important one that you get from the statistics is what time you see the Steve from satellite observations and that is a pre-midnight time. Um, all of these are very consistent with um, what's observed on the ground. 
Um, the westward drift is really important. Uh, that's a consequence of the poleward electric field crossed into the magnetic field. Um, whether you're um, at, at the pole, at the northern pole, at the southern pole, or out in the magnetosphere, basically you're going to get this kind of westward drift. Um, so that's uh, one reason that um, is characteristic to this, this feature. Um, I'll talk more about what's happening in the magnetosphere to cause this as well in a little bit. Um, okay, and then there's been a bunch of really great rapid progress uh, since this first study. Um, Bea uh, um, looked in the Themis ASI database and found 28 events going back over 10 years um, and studied them with respect to <clears throat> their characteristics, where they were, how long they lasted, um, how they related to substorm phase. And, um, and that was a really interesting study right after our initial paper. Um, and those, those events were pretty rare and they typically happened at the end of the substorm expansion phase after a bunch of injections, after you have these westward traveling surges at higher latitudes. Um, <clears throat> and uh, those characteristics are also largely consistent with when people have seen SAIDs for many years. Uh, the big deal is that people did not know that these extreme SAIDs would cause this visible signature. Um, Bill Archer uh, did some great work on uh, figuring out what the height of the Steves uh, was. And um, basically the purple is around 200 kilometers and the little green features are around 110 kilometers. Um, I will show in a minute that uh, the, the height of the purple is also consistent with um, past observations from 100 years ago that none of us realized existed um, until we did and, uh, and uh, also had a similar result. Um, <clears throat> a uh, citizen scientist uh, with a physics degree in another field, Michael Honnickel, also has put together some very extensive databases. Steve, that I'll get into, and has noted uh, some of their unusual properties as well. So that's also um, really great work uh, from the citizen science side. Um, there's a, uh, another big unknown was what is that purple color? <laughs> and why is it not usual Aurora? Um, Steve is definitely not driven by electron precipitation like the typical Aurora. Um, Megan Gillies has a very nice paper, um, came out in 2019, showing uh, spectrograph results um, of the Steve event and basically showing that um, there's a continuum of enhanced um, emissions that, uh, that accompanies Steve. And this is surprising. It's not any of the typical wavelengths of um, Aurora, which explains why uh, Steve events are so dim in um, filtered cameras. Um, and uh, yes. Um, and then she also showed uh, the observations for the picket fence, showing especially an enhancement um, of the 5577 green line. Um, and, uh, um, yes. All right, I'm going to keep going and come back to that. Um, so Steve is, has been studied all over the world, reported all over the world. Um, recently in the last couple of years, it is definitely, um, along with kind of not many storms, it has been seen, um, mostly near the equinoxes. Um, and we map this dynamic boundary um, in 3D space and really work to understand the physics in 3D space. Um, the Michael Hunnicle event list, which is published on the Open Science Framework, um, has really great 
uh, <clears throat> magnitude of observations uh, from citizen scientists showing uh, more than 800 um, single observations, 200 observation days, um, the proper collection of using these data. And he's also looked at the correlation with many, uh, with some geomagnetic indices um, and many other um, features of the Steves. So um, that's uh, uh, a tremendous um, resource <clears throat> that's available now. Um, and uh, can find more events through that that can then find more conjunctions with our traditional satellite observations, um, as, as well as inner hemisphere observations. Those reports indicate um, a great number of increase uh, since 2015, especially when uh, there started to be a lot of coverage of this and talk of this and questions about this, um, as well as some of the seasonal dependence um, and indications that Steve is seen uh, in most small storms, especially, um, and also um, Um, or non-storm times, um, or substorms within storms, um, all of that. Um, Michael also looked at a number of historical observations, including those by Carl Stormer, uh, which are summarized in a 1935 paper on subauroral forms that has a lot of really interesting results. Um, and Carl Stormer called these uh, events feeble homogeneous arcs of great altitude. His work was um, um, fundamental to determining the altitude of aurora of all different kinds. And so he very quickly noted that these had a much higher altitude around 200 kilometers than typical aurora. <clears throat> okay, so now what about the picket fence going on there? Um, there is a lot of interesting plasma physics going on there that's visible and not fully understood. Um, the perspective from the ground is also interesting and requires a lot of careful work to um, work out what angles people are looking at the Steve and um, what height the picket fence is and, and all of that. Um, so Michael and I and Josh Semeter and um, other colleagues at Boston University noticed that in addition to the picket fence, which has um, some field aligned elements, it also has some tiny little um, possibly even point source like elements on the very um, uh, lower altitude edge of it. And um, Josh has dug into these and um, uh, looked into what could be happening there and how we can constrain the physics. Um, that's a paper that is um, under review or revision right now. And it's also really interesting that um, citizen science observations, especially those with shorter exposure times, can um, find these. Um, <clears throat> there's another uh, movie here of one of these events that was in May 2018, I believe, um, and um, really shows all kinds of exceptional um, plasma physics happening there that we have not yet fully understood. I am rapidly going through time, so I'm going to go quickly through these. Um, this is a great video by Neil Zeller. I called it the best video, but I think there's some new contenders for what could be the best video of the Steve features. Um, and uh, this should maybe be an Aurorasaurus competition. We definitely um, appreciate this video though, and it's featured in, in Josh's paper. Um, but as I said, a shorter exposure time will highlight um, more features of the Steve. And that's something that Michael noticed and has and um, promoting 
Uh, he as well has a new triangulation technique for citizen science images and the picket fence in particular and the way that the picket fence moves west as well. Um, that's very detailed and is a way to um, make sure that the cameras are, uh, the times are together by registering um, these discrete features. So I have a lot of images here and I'm going to keep going quickly on that, but um, that work is um, one uh, kind of opening up like a new uh, turbulent, um, maybe not new, but the observations can really show the evolution of the picket fence and what that means um, to the drivers, both in the magnetosphere and the ionosphere. Um, now I want to shift a little bit to, um, to the magnetospheric implications um, and highlight some work, um, again, by Shaning Chu. Um, this is from his paper with a really great conjunction event. Um, I also want to um, highlight, though I don't have a slide on it, um, Toshi Nishimura's work that has showed that Steve um, uh, substorms tend to start a little more on the kind of westward flank of the magnetosphere. And that might be one reason why some substorms have steves and some do not. Um, I think that's an important, a significant um, uh, clue in terms of what's happening here. Um, and I think, you know, we're really at the stage of putting together a number of these clues and um, working together on this. So that's really exciting. Um, uh, Shaning's group and paper highlights uh, a Steve event in 2018 that was captured by all sky imagers, captured by citizen scientists on the ground, um, swarm, has swarm B observations, and has um, Van Allen probes uh, footprints that directly cross the Steve at the time of the event, um, which is, I think, probably one of the best conjunctions with satellite data that we've found. Um, and so the Van Allen probes are out in the magnetosphere. They are five Earth radii um, out, and that is an important region for sensing what's um, driving uh, the Steve um, as well. Let's see. Um, okay, so these are Van Allen probe observations. Um, uh, that I'm going to do right now. Um, but it's there, um, there because the Van Allen probes have particle measurements, ion measurements, um, mass measurements of mass, measurements of waves, um, you can really see a lot of what might be driving uh, the Steve in the magnetosphere and the connection potentially to uh, where the plasma pause is. Um, where the ion and electron uh, plasma sheet regions are, and in particular, um, the fact that the ion plasma sheet is more equatorward than the um, electron plasma sheet, and in association with kinetic alphane waves. Um, and there have also been a number of other people um, and theorists as well who have um, um, made uh, observations and important work in this area. Um, he has a nice summary um, chart on this and cartoon that I particularly like. Um, so uh, showing again in the magnetosphere region this outward electric field, um, the ions that are drifting west, um, what's happening uh, with the sharp plasma pause, um, and all of the fluxes. So there's a lot to put together there still. Um, I have uh, pretty much run out of time here. I have not gotten to all of the major questions or all of the major work. Um, some of the other work that's recently come out on, especially on um, what could be causing the light, that purple color, Brian Harding and Steve Mendy's work is really um, uh, put forth one of the theories and models um, describing what chemistry is happening in the atmosphere at these sub-auroral latitudes with this strong flow that we didn't know about 
um, and uh, and is working. Um, it's really um, a good and hopefully more combination to come of that. Um, some of the other open questions really is, uh, as we learn more about Steve, can we predict it? Definitely wouldn't recommend, um, well, chasing Steve is a thing, but it, it helps if you live somewhere that Steve does hang out. <laughs> um, but it also helps, it helps if we have storms. And so hopefully we will have more storms and substorms um, over the next couple of years as the solar cycle is ramping up again. And people will be observing um, Aurora to the north and they will look um, straight overhead as well. And Um, that's how uh, how it's typically visible in um, uh, in Alberta, especially. Yeah, I think there's open questions about the connection to um, SAR arcs and these larger SAPS regions and larger storms. We just haven't had a lot of those larger storms in this past solar. Um, there's also con uh, questions about could there be some space weather impacts. Uh, from these very strong flows, I think there could be a little, a little, a lot of interesting work there. Um, and there's been a little bit of work with radars, but not that much with the radar data yet that I'm aware of. Um, maybe I've missed something, but um, but that's that. Those are some of the open questions. Um, I did want to say that the media coverage has definitely helped uh, recruit and reward citizen scientists. Uh, for some of you, which is fantastic, um, <clears throat> the story has just taken off. Uh, for some of you with kids, there's a really cute podcast called Wow in the World that did this amazing feature on Steve. Uh, there have been high school students who have done research on Steve um, and how to measure it and all kinds of different aspects, multiple high school students. Um, so it's been really rewarding. And even there's been a, there's a great documentary done by Canadian um, filmmakers called Chasing Steve, which is now available um, on demand on Vimeo. Uh, so highly recommend that as well to learn more about the citizen scientists and their role. Um, we invite people to um, document their auroras through Aurorasaurus. And uh, I think this is gonna become even more even bigger in the next solar max, especially because ones can now take photos of Aurora. Um, and uh, that's shown in this, um, in this is actually my cell phone image from Yellowknife Canada of a pre minor Aurora. And I'm not a photographer, but my cell phone can do it. I will uh, happily take pictures there. <clears throat> And I think there's also in the field a lot of renewed interest in satellite auroral imaging. So that's going to happen uh, hopefully over the next few years. And we do have a postdoc opportunity. So feel free to talk to me about that. <clears throat> that's it. Excuse me. Thank you, Liz. That was very good, very informative, very interesting. We're sorry that we had slight connection problem with some people. Uh, but I think most people were hearing fine. So um, there was a lot of good comments and questions. Also, we have a lot of good links posted in the chat. Mm -hmm. Please look at it. And if you miss it, we will try to put it on the website so you can catch it later. Um, we will go to the questions. The first question comes from Harold Frey. And the question is, how many percentage of normal Aurora night also show the Steve? Do we know this? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I don't think I have that chart from Michael. And indeed, like a citizen scientist might be able to answer that question better. Um, but it, I think that it's not that rare in that it's not 30 events over 10 years. Um, if there have been 200 events over the uh, since 2015 in the citizen science database. And so there's quite a bit of, um, I think we're still establishing the frequency 
and even um, that's a question that, although I think citizen scientists can really contribute to, it wouldn't necessarily be appropriate to get an absolute rate from citizen science because it's biased by where people are. So I can really just say that anecdotally, many small storms um, and even July 13th, there was a small storm. Um, many small storms seem to have Steve's and we've been having lots of small last couple years <clears throat> in a declining phase. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Whitham Reeves. Are there any radio phenomena, propagation, noise, etc., associated with the steep? Yes, uh, that's a great question. <clears throat> um, I think that Gareth Perry gave a talk about that on, at the CDAR session uh, recently, and so I would point you to that. Um, <clears throat> And I think it's also something that there could very well be more observations. I will give a shout out to the ham size citizen science projects um, at Aurora Source. We've been collaborating with Nathaniel Forsell and their team and talking about how to collect radio observations uh, alongside the Aurora observations and get everything into kind of a proper um, uh, database, proper metadata, so you can make sure that you're looking at the same thing. But um, that's as much as I know on that uh, right now. Okay, great. I think that's all the questions that we have, but we had a lot of good comments and links that people can follow later and get information. Uh, there was a lot of posts in the chat box. Please do follow it on our website. Um, and also, I would like to remind everyone to join us next week. We have Christine from Aerospace, uh, who will be talking about convection and substance. And once again, thank you so much, Dr. Liz McDonald. That was a great talk, very informative and very clear. Thank you. Thank you.